If you were standing on the Earth the day before, looking at these magnificent beasts, which totally dominate terrestrial ecosystems and had for 165 million years, you would say, well, these things are never going away. These things are going to dominate our planet forever. And then the next day, they're all gone. And that should be a cautionary tale for us. This is The Butterfly Effect, a podcast that shows the big impact a small action can do. Tali Orat is talking to those special people that make a difference with nature and trees. Welcome everyone to The Butterfly Effect. My name is Tali Orat. I'm your host and your butterfly here. My special guest today is Dr. Kenneth Lacovera, an explorer, a paleontologist, and an author. Dr. Lacovera has unearthed some of the largest dinosaurs ever to walk the earth, including the massive 65-ton Dreadnoughtus. He is a recipient of the Explorer Club Medal, previously awarded to pioneers such as Neil Armstrong and Sir Edmund Hillary. His 2016 TED Talk has been viewed by over 2 million people, and his book, Why Dinosaurs Matter, is a winner of the Natalis Book Prize. La Covera's discoveries has landed him three time in Discover Magazine's 100 Top Science Stories of the Year, and he has appeared in over 13 television documentaries. He is the founding dean of the School of Earth and Environment at Rowan University and is director of the Edelman Fossil Park, where he and his team are building a $75 million museum designed to connect people to deep time, the contingencies of natural history, and the fragility of our planet. Currently, Dr. Lacovera is researching the extinction of the dinosaurs. Hello, Ken, and welcome to the Butterfly Effect. Hi, Tally. It's so nice to be with you. These are some amazing accomplishments. Congratulations. Uh, well, thank you. I've been very fortunate to be able to turn exploration into a profession. Ken, I'd love for us to start with talking about your discoveries. Well, in specific, Dreadnoughtus. I hope I pronounce it well. Mm -hmm. Can you share with us a bit on this experience and what does it mean to the scientific community? I found Dreadnoughtus in uh, Patagonia, southernmost Argentina, in 2005. I was down there prospecting for giant dinosaurs because it's mm -hmm. a place that has rocks of the right age that are sedimentary rocks, meaning that you can have a fossil in them. Mm -hmm. and where vast amounts of these rocks are exposed in badlands. So you get good rates of erosion, which are always exposing new rocks. The first bone that I wandered upon was the femur, which is the largest bone in your body, your, your upper leg bone. And in the case of Dreadnoughtus, that's almost seven feet long. Wow. Usually these big dinosaurs, because it's really hard to, to cover a big dinosaur rapidly, right? They don't get buried very fast, so they tend to get scavenged or weathered away. And the big mm -hmm. ones are usually pretty incomplete. But this one uh, got caught up in some kind of soupy situation uh, 77 million years ago and sank down into the earth rather quickly. And therefore, a lot of its body was preserved. And ultimately, we recovered about 70% of its skeleton. So that makes it the the most complete of the supermassive dinosaurs that are known, but also uh, because we recovered both the upper arm bone, the humerus, and the femur, that allows us to use a mathematical formula to estimate its mass. And so Dreadnoughtus is the largest creature for which both the humerus and the femur have been recovered, and we estimate its mass in life at about 65 tons. Wow. So to put that in perspective, that's nine T Rex or 13 African elephants. Wow, wow. Well, you said it like it was a walk in the park and you were just <laughs> walk, wandering and all of a sudden you discovered, I mean, I'm assuming it's like finding a needle in a haystack and it's, it's dreading and it's hard and you need a lot of stamina. What, what makes a man get up one day and just, let's go look for a dinosaur? Well, it is hard. The, the work is grueling. I would typically be out there in the field for three, four months at a time living in a tent. So no electricity, no plumbing for three or four months. And I did this for years. Right. So there's a lot of deprivations that go along with this kind of field work. But none of that really matters when you're doing something that you love. And what I find addicting about 
my science, paleontology, is that every day I get to see something that no human has ever seen before. Every day I get to know something that no human has ever known before. And that's just an amazing feeling. And then, of course, the, the next instinct is to tell everyone. Right? Carl Sagan <laughs> said, when you're in love, you want to tell the world. And so that's what I want to do about uh, dinosaurs and the Earth's past. But it's hard for me to express the, the reverential feeling and the, and the feeling of awe that one can have when you sit and you look at this extinct creature and you make that personal connection between yourself and it and you realize that you know in the case of a new species like dreadnoughtus this organism that evolved through its own auspices and was awesome on its own and lived way before humans mm -hmm. now its entire legacy is in my hands i'm the one who gets to bring this thing to light and i i feel a, a responsibility to to those animals to treat their legacy in a way that, that really reflects their accomplishments when they were alive. By the way, you were able to treat their legacy by, by naming it, right? Yeah. Um, when you find a new species, you get to name it. And I think of that as almost a solemn responsibility. And so I try to pick a name that honors what they were able to do in life and that says something about them. And so herbivores plant eaters, you think of them as, well, they're not the ones you have to watch out for, right? You have to watch out for the carnivores. But that's not really the case. If you, if you go to Africa, any any safari guide will tell you the most dangerous animals are the herbivores. The hippopotamus are terribly dangerous. Elephants kill a lot of people, unfortunately. In, in Yellowstone, the bison are what kill people, really, not the grizzly bears. Wow. And so if you think about a 65-ton herbivore like Dreadnoughtus, who was maybe territorial, maybe it's in the breeding season, maybe they're protecting uh, you know, their, their realm. Wow, that's going to be a fearsome creature. And who's going to attack anything that's nine times the size of a T-Rex? So what does it have to fear? Dread not, right? Fear nothing. And so I, I gave it that name to reflect its ferocity that it would have had when it was alive. I love it. I love it. And you mentioned its size and you mentioned that it's vegetarian. Now, as this is a podcast about trees and nature, mm -hmm. one of the questions that may be silly, but was there enough vegetation for all of them? They were huge, right? And they were probably not the only ones. That's right. And clearly they were extracting huge amounts of resources from their ecosystem and you know clearly by their existence there was enough energy in the system to support them but we also have to remember if you go back to the cretaceous it's a much more productive time than it is today temperatures were were much warmer in the cretaceous those temperatures were equable from pole to pole we didn't have glaciers at the poles we didn't have ice in the mountains and CO2 levels were also higher. Now, right now, the Earth is facing a terrible crisis because of rising levels of CO2. And I, I do think that it's an existential crisis for human beings. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's not really the absolute level of CO2 that is a problem right now. It's the rate of change. The Earth has had higher levels of CO2, but it achieved those levels over geological time, over millions and millions of years. Now we're achieving levels that haven't been seen in tens of millions of years in, in just a hundred years, which is right. devastating to the ecosystem. But imagine that we did achieve those levels over millions of years. Plants love CO2, right? That's like their oxygen and plants love warm conditions. So during the Cretaceous, when you had high levels of, of both temperature and CO2, the productivity at the plant level was astounding. And so that then forms the base of the food chain, and that is able then to fuel these giant herbivores, which then can support these giant carnivores. And so the whole thing was just this cornucopia of, of abundant life back then. I know you're researching their extinction. Mm -hmm. What lesson have you learned so far? Well, and this kind of plays into, you know, your theme, the butterfly effect. Mm -hmm. It's that, you know, if you, if you learn the language of the rocks, the rocks will start to talk to you. And if you learn to read the rocks, everywhere in the world you go, the rocks will begin to whisper the same thing to you. And 
what they whisper is it didn't have to be this way. And Earth history shows us over and over and over again that it's also contingent. And so you just change one little thing here and all the future changes as a result of mm-hmm. that. So first, the dinosaurs didn't have to come to be, but they did right through an accident of both evolution and biogeography. Right. For a long time, the dinosaurs, after they first evolved, they kind of had the underhand and crocodiles were really the dominant form of large animals on land. And then uh, near the end of the Triassic period, there was a a mass extinction. And for whatever reason, the crocodiles got hit harder than the dinosaurs and the dinosaurs bounced back quicker and they became the dominant form at the end of the Triassic going into the famous Jurassic period and then the Cretaceous, their, their last big period. But that didn't have to be. And then you know, they get snuffed out 66 million years ago by a chance collision with an asteroid. And this asteroid, like all asteroids, it formed at the same time that our solar system formed, the same time the Earth formed. So that's about four and a half billion years ago. It was out there when the very first dinosaur evolved. It was out there in the Jurassic when, you know, they started to become dominant. And then Mm -hmm. one day, things just align and it hits the Earth and it wipes them out and it wiped them out. You know, dinosaurs at that point had been dominant for about 165 million years. They were probably all gone that day, which is absolutely shocking. So if you were standing on the earth the day before, looking at these magnificent beasts, which totally dominate terrestrial ecosystems and had for 165 million years, you would say, well, these things are never going away. These things are going to dominate our planet forever. And then the next day, they're all gone. And that should be a cautionary tale for us. Humans can have a lot of hubris. We can see ourselves as being the the dominant organisms on this planet of ours. And we kind of think we're in charge. And we are not necessarily. All of this that we treasure, all of this that we know, could go away quite rapidly if we don't pay attention to the past, learn the lessons of the past, and then uh, steward this planet to create a a better and sustainable tomorrow. And so for me, the real value of understanding the past is that's the only place we will ever get information to help guide our way into the future. It was Churchill who said, the further back you look, the further ahead you can see. And so I consider the fossil record, the geological record, to be a vital tool that we need to plot our way into this perilous environmental future that we're all facing. One of the things you were mentioning is that asteroid, nobody see, sees it coming or dinosaurs not seeing it coming and a prosperous world that once existed all of a sudden disappears. Now, On your TED Talk, you mentioned climate change as the asteroid, and I totally understand that, and I totally, totally agree with that. But as opposed to the dinosaurs, where the asteroid was something they could not have controlled, not in a million years, they couldn't have done anything about it, we can do something about it. And it's basically something that we are 100% full control of. So... I'm just wondering, I, I know you, you study dinosaurs and the, the extinction, and, and you believe it matters for understanding climate change. I would just love to know maybe why and, and how do you see that connection being a bit more stronger? I 100% agree. The dinosaurs, they couldn't control that fate. And so their extinction in no way besmirches their magnificent legacy. We, on the other hand, we, you know, as I, as I said in the TED Talk, we are the asteroid. And, you know, we're, we are both the asteroid and the victim of the asteroid, along with all the other organisms on the planet. Mm-hmm. And unlike the dinosaurs, we do have a choice. And so it's really incumbent upon us to use that ability that we have to change things to begin to change things in the positive direction, because we're certainly changing things right now, but, but largely in the negative direction. And we haven't really come to terms with the fact that we humans are now a planetary engineering force. 
most of the destruction, most of the change that we are imparting into the natural system has not been intentional, and very little of it. it. We are making these changes as byproducts of other activities that, that we are engaged in. I, sometimes I think about like monkeys loose on the bridge of the Starship Enterprise, right? And now they are incredibly powerful. They have this entire Starship at their disposal, but yeah. they're pushing all the buttons and they're pulling all the levers and they don't really know what these things do. And that's kind of what we're doing to the planet right now. We're pushing the buttons, we're pulling the levers, but we're not really taking into account the big picture. So we need to become intentional about what we are doing to the planet because you know, we don't have another place to go. We, we live on this tiny little lifeboat in space. Mars is not the answer. I'm sorry, Elon Musk, but <laughs> Mars is not planet B. I hope we explore Mars. That would be awesome. And I think we will. But we're not going to put a million people on Mars. Mars is terrible. We have a whole continent here on Earth, Antarctica, that we truly can't colonize. We pump a lot of resources into maintaining a scientific colony there. But you know, there's no agriculture in Antarctica. There's not a breeding population of humans there. And Antarctica has niceties like air and water, you know, easily right. accessible water, which Mars doesn't have. So mm -hmm. if you contextualize the Earth inside the solar system and then start to pull out and look at it as its place in the galaxy, we are truly alone. We are truly on this little lifeboat in the desolate desert of space. So all we have is this place and each other, and we need to look inward to to solve our problems because we're not getting another home. This is this is our one and only home, I think. This is what the plans for the museum that you are building to connect people with the contingencies of natural history. Can you share some of them with us? Yeah, that's right. So at at Rowan University, we are building the uh, Gene and Rick Edelman Fossil Park. And this is a, at a site in New Jersey that is actually very important in the history of paleontology, the history of life on Earth, because we have recorded in the layers of the quarry that exists there. It's an old mining quarry. We have a, a four-acre hole in the ground that's about 45 feet deep. And we have recorded there the last moments of the dinosaurs. So we have the world's fifth mass extinction recorded in the quarry climb up out of the quarry, you're in today's world, and we're experiencing the, the world's sixth mass extinction. So in the museum, we will take visitors on a, on a journey to show them the ancient past at this spot. It's all very place-based. So we'll show them the kind of dinosaurs and other prehistoric creatures that existed on the east coast of North America 66 million years ago. Mm -hmm. Then we'll show them the marine creatures that existed exactly on this spot. Like these fossils were dug up from nearly under their feet. And then we will lay out the, the, the TikTok, the events that unfolded in, in the terrible fifth mass extinction that wiped out the dinosaurs and 75% of life on earth. And then we'll take them forward to the dual existential crises that we are facing today, which is the, the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis. Mm -hmm. And then finally, um, we will give them reasons for hope in the battle to save our planet, to save our environment, and calls to action, things that they can do uh, themselves and things that they can do if they organize to help push back against these, these devastating trends. And so the whole theme of the place really is to use the past to inform our action in the present to build a better future. So what are some of the tips you will give them? You have some audience here. So what we plan to do with the visitors is ask them questions like, what would you like to do? Would you like to save money on your energy bills? Well, then if that's the case, there's a whole suite of things that you can do, right? You can, you can go for LED lights or you can put solar power and you can insulate better. You can do all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Would you like to help uh, songbirds in your area? Well, then you can plant the kinds of uh, uh, trees and shrubs that um, help them survive. You can not use pesticides so that you uh, don't kill off the insects on which they rely. And, and so there's all kinds of things you can do there. Would you like to keep plastics out of the ocean? And so we'll give them ideas in that regard. And then mm -hmm. planting trees is certainly one of the best things you can do. Um, not only does it help sequester carbon from the atmosphere, but 
it produces oxygen, and importantly, it provides habitat for organisms. And, you know, climate change kind of gets most of the press, and that's understandable because it's such a dire crisis, but the biodiversity crisis is, is every bit as severe and also an existential crisis for humanities. For humanity. And it goes and, hand in hand, yes. And it goes hand in hand. And so planting a tree addresses both of the existential crises that, that humans are really facing. Now, I'd love for us to go back a little bit and, and talk about the dinosaurs. One thing I, I would love to know, as a paleontologist, what are the biggest misconceptions you find people have about dinosaurs? Oh, there are so many. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they really are. The The first one is that, and I started my book, Why Dinosaurs Matter, with a chapter on this, is the way that the word dinosaur has entered the lexicon as a pejorative to mean someone or something that is obsolete or no longer useful. Mm -hmm. And that couldn't be further from the truth. Dinosaurs went extinct only because of an accident, and they were unbelievably successful for 165 million years, dominating every continent. And in the book, I make the analogy, you know, would we consider Marie Curie or Louis Armstrong or Benjamin Franklin, do, do we think of them as failures because one day they died, right? right. Because one day they, they took that step that all living creatures take over the threshold of life into oblivion? Uh, of course not, right? That's what, that's what us living things do. And not only was the dinosaurs' extinction not their fault, as opposed to what's happening now, which is our fault, uh, they didn't all go extinct. The birds survived, and birds are dinosaurs. It's not that birds are related to dinosaurs. Birds are truly dinosaurs. And you get to be a dinosaur if you have an ancestor that is a dinosaur. And that's... Wait, 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 wait. Birds <laughs> are dinosaurs? I'm birds are dinosaurs. Catch you. Birds are so dinosaurs. Birds are 100% dinosaurs. So it's not the case that all dinosaurs went extinct at the end of the Cretaceous period. Only what we call the non-avian dinosaurs went extinct. Today, the avian dinosaurs, the birds, uh -huh. outnumber mammalian species by three to one. And they actually do have a breeding population in Antarctica, the emperor penguins. So dinosaurs today are still the only large animal that is dominant on every continent on Earth. That's cool. So penguins are dinosaurs. Penguins are dinosaurs. A ruby-throated hummingbird is a dinosaur. It's just the same way that, you know, you and a camel and a wombat and a, and a bear are all mammals because you all have that first mammal for an ancestor, right? Right. Once, once you're in a family group, there's no way to get kicked out of it, right? I mean, you have your own personal family, And that's because you all trace back to the same ancestor. We're mammals because we have mammals for ancestors. And a flamingo is a dinosaur because a flamingo has the first dinosaur for an ancestor. Okay, so birds are dinosaurs. That's the yep. first misconception. What's another one? That dinosaurs should be connoted with failure or obsolescence. They were anything mm -hmm. but. And so they, they were unbelievably successful. They're still crazily successful. So, I mean, you could call me a dinosaur anytime. That's a great compliment. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> <laughs> and then there are lots of misconceptions about individual dinosaurs. There are just some very old ideas that entered the public imagination, you know, some of these over a hundred years ago, and they just won't go away. Like the idea that some dinosaurs were so long that they had two brains. Maybe you've heard that one. That was never the case. That came about because somebody looked at, at a stegosaurus skeleton and they saw these kind of openings in the tail vertebrae and they weren't familiar with those kind of openings. And they thought, well, they must, they must park another brain back there to help drive the back kind of like a hook and ladder fire truck. Um, <laughs> but, but that never happened. There were all kinds of crazy ideas about their extinction before we knew about the asteroid. The, that, the asteroid idea only came about in 1980. And before that, humans do what humans always do. If we don't know the answer, we make stuff up. <laughs> and, and people made up humans a lot of crazy ideas. Yeah. yeah. So there were ideas that us sneaky mammals, we, we ate all their eggs, or that sex determination dinosaurs was temperature dependent and it got too hot to make males or too cold to make females or something like that. 
there was an idea that caterpillars, this was a published paper, that, <laughs> that caterpillars ate all the fiber-rich plants and all the dinosaurs everywhere in the world died of constipation. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. So there's no shortage of dinosaur misconceptions. I can see that. Wow. (laughs) By the way, what what are your thoughts on the latest finding of that dinosaur nesting with the eggs? Dinosaurs all laid eggs, right? And birds still do today. Mm -hmm. There are no live bearing dinosaurs. A, A lot of dinosaur nests and eggs have been discovered over decades. And we know from those nests that some dinosaurs provided parental care and others didn't. And we see this with all kinds of organisms today. Mm-hmm. And we can see this because some dinosaur nests have eggs in them where the, the bottom half of the egg is perfectly preserved. The top half is gone. And so it's obvious that those babies didn't spend any time in the nest after they hatched. They just popped out of the eggs and they went. Mm-hmm. Whereas other dinosaur nests show not whole eggs, but lots of egg fragments. So the babies hatched and they were hanging out in the nest for a long time, crushing the eggs. But also you can see in their bones, the ones that, that died as hatchlings, you can see that they're, the condyles on their bones, the ends of their bones aren't fully formed. They're kind of spongy. So these dinosaurs weren't even capable of getting up and, and running around. They were kind of like, if you think of like a baby robin in a nest, you know how they're all, mm-hmm. all floopy. <laughs> they, can't, they can't really even <laughs> hold themselves up. So some of the birds, they're, they're called altricial birds. Some of the dinosaurs were, bur- were born like that. And some of the dinosaurs were precocial when they were born. So just like with mammals today and just like with birds today, just a, a panoply of ecological strategies and the same yeah. diversity of, of parenting strategies. So, you know, when you think of, of dinosaurs, just think of that same diversity that you see today. And they had they were in every kind of niche. They ate every kind of food. They had every kind of, of strategy for bringing young in, into the world, diverse and complex. So how would you explain their survival? Now, one of the reasons that, that it may be the case that only the birds survive is that all of, the, all of the non-avian dinosaur nests that have ever been found, so the regular dinosaurs, mm-hmm. are all just a crater in the ground that some mama dinosaur scraped where she deposited her eggs right on the surface of the earth. So when that asteroid hits and it releases this horrific heat blast around the planet, there's no place to hide. You have 100% of your life cycle on the surface of the earth. Mm -hmm. However, the one group of dinosaurs that gets through, the birds, we know that today there are burrowing penguins, there's burrowing owls, there's burrowing swallows. And so the one group of dinosaurs that we know for sure that has some burrowing members happens to be the one group that gets through. So I think that's not a coincidence. It's the same with, you know, little mammals get through pretty well and little Mm -hmm. like shrew-like creatures, good burrowers, things like turtles, lizards, crocodiles, Mm -hmm. good burrowers. These are all things that make it through the extinction event. So not necessarily the bigger that survives, it's actually the smaller. That's correct. That's exactly what happened. And will we see the same in sea or only the birds? So it's kind of like two parallel mass extinctions. On land, the main driver of extinction is the heat blast and all kinds of other terrible things that happen that day. There's, there's acid rain, there's mudslides, there's horrendous um, earthquakes. In the ocean, you're probably okay that day unless you happen to be actually under the asteroid when it hit. Mm-hmm. But all that dust and gas flies up into the sky. Some of it probably goes suborbital for a time. And the result is that it shrouds out the sun. That then knocks out, to a large degree, phytoplankton in the ocean. And so if you kick out the base of the marine food chain, then that quickly precipitates up the food chain. And then big things like mosasaurs, which are these giant marine reptiles of the Cretaceous, they begin to starve then. And so we have the, the direct cause of extinction on land being directly from the asteroid, the heat blast, etc., and then in the ocean, it's a subsequent extinction from starvation. Okay, so th- this podcast is related to trees and nature and hope. <laughs> this is very depressing. <laughs> so you invite the extinction guy on. <laughs> and 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 I, I I feel like you you will agree with me that with no hope we are paralyzed and, and there is no reason for us to change. But I found out that there is one tree from the dinosaurs' age one that survived all those years 
and it's called the Wallamine pine. Mm-hmm. Wallamine will, pine, yep. Yes, some will mm-hmm. call it the dinosaur tree. <laughs> so, y- you know about this? I do, tree? yeah. So this is um, one of a number of species that are known as Lazarus species from the story in the Bible of, of resurrection. Mm-hmm. So this was a tree that was known first from the fossil record, and it was thought to have been extinct for tens of millions of years. And then in the 1990s, a stand of Wollamy pines was found growing in Australia, in the mountains of Australia. Yeah. But there are a number of, of species like the, uh, the coelacanth was first known from the fossil record. And then in the 1930s, uh, one was dredged up off the coast of South Africa. And so sometimes we get these surprises. That's um, amazing. By the time the dinosaurs went extinct, you would recognize many of the trees. Angiosperms, the flowering plants, mm-hmm. they um, first appear about 125 million years ago. So that's like the middle part of the Cretaceous period, the early middle part of the Cretaceous period. And by the time the dinosaurs go extinct, there are things like magnolia, there are things like uh, sweet gum or uh, cherry and certain pines. And so you would, you would recognize some of the plants. Grasses are just starting to get going at about this time. And, you know, some of the wildlife is becoming quite modern. You, you never see this in museum reconstructions, but by the end of the Cretaceous, there's ducks <laughs> and there, there's parrots by the end of the Cretaceous. And so, you know, the modern world is starting to take shape right as they go extinct. And then we see the, the first trees appear in the fossil record way, way back uh, in the Devonian period. That's about 385 million years ago, long before the first dinosaurs. And the first trees were tree ferns. So they weren't hardwood trees or even softwood trees like we have today, but they're ferns that are arboreal. And there are still some tree ferns today. And they Mm -hmm. form the first forests in the Devonian. But forests don't really take off and become sort of a a dominant feature uh, across continents until the Carboniferous period. And this is sometimes known as the age of coal, right? And that's because of all the trees. And so what happens in the Carboniferous about 350 million years ago is we get the first really big forests uh, that are widespread on earth. And, you know, what are trees great at? Uh, You certainly know this better than anyone at sequestering CO2, right? Mm -hmm. And so these trees are sucking in huge amounts of, of CO2 and fixing it in their wood. And then they're dying and they fall over. But these forests are brand new. So we don't have termites yet. We don't really have a way to break down these trees. And so the trees get buried and they get preserved and they take the carbon with them. And the result in the carboniferous is that the atmosphere becomes deplete in carbon dioxide and the ratio of carbon dioxide to oxygen gets way out of whack. So right now we have about 21% oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere. In the Carboniferous, that went up to 35%. So that means really bad forest fires, right? Because it's really easy to light stuff on fire in the Carboniferous. But it also has other interesting effects like insects are largely limited in size by the concentration of oxygen in the atmosphere because they don't breathe actively like we do. They don't have lungs where they can pump air in in and out of their bodies. Insects generally have these trachea that they, like tubes in many cases that come up their legs and they just absorb oxygen from the atmosphere through osmosis. Mm -hmm. So it's this passive system. And so no part of an insect can be very far away from the atmosphere because otherwise they can't diffuse oxygen into that part of their body. But if there's a higher concentration of oxygen, it's easier to diffuse it into the body so the body or the body can get bigger. And so in, in the Carboniferous, we end up with dragonflies that are as big as eagles and, and we have pill bugs that are the length of a car, like eight, nine feet long. Wow. So basically what the trees did was adapt evolved and transformed the planet for us to come and dominate it. And hopefully we will not destroy it. Yeah, that's right. It's really, you know, it's a combination of the the phytoplankton in the ocean and the trees on land that have made the atmosphere that has made us possible. And speaking of trees, what is your favorite tree? 
That is a hard one for me. I am, I don't know if you know this about me, in, in my spare time, I'm a woodworker. Oh. So I do a lot of unplugged woodworking. I, I like to make furniture with no electricity. So I'll mm-hmm. just get a log and split it and turn that into lumber and then use hand tools to make mortise and tenon joints or dovetail joints. And so, you know, I really enjoy working with walnut. One of the reasons is that it's indigenous. And so I try to use just local species in my woodworking. There's no reason to import, you know, lumber from Brazil. That's not mm-hmm. good for anything. And it's a, walnut, is, when you cut into it, it has just such a nice smell to it. And it, it really works well. It planes well. And it's just a beautiful wood. And so I really like working with that. And if I could pick another one, it would be the American holly. It's indigenous to where I grew up, which is on the, the coast of southern New Jersey. It's a very low-lying area, lots of wetlands. Mm-hmm. And holly is the tree that grows in those environments. So it reminds me of home. The wood yeah. of holly is is almost white. It's a very, very light yellow. Uh, so it's a beautiful wood as well. And, you know, it's really nice taking hikes in the winter in those areas because it's still green and then you have the, the beautiful berries. And so I just, mm-hmm. I love those trees. Wow, beautiful. Thank you so much, Ken, for this fascinating discussion on Dinosaur Planet, Going Back in Time, and no, trees. It's my pleasure. And thank you, everyone, for joining me today. We are all beautiful butterflies, each in his and her individual ways. I wanted to thank you for joining me today in this episode. I really appreciate you coming on this journey with me, and I hope you can join me next time. And remember, it only takes a small action to make a big difference. Be a butterfly. And that's all for this episode. Thank you for joining us today. Please subscribe to hear more of our stories of change. 